Good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started. Wow. Uh, my name is Mary Hall, and I'm from University of Utah, and I have the honor of introducing the FCRC 2019 plenary speakers. Uh, these speakers were nominated by the FCRC conferences and uh, selected for the cross-disciplinary impact of their work. As I've been, the narrative uh, across the week is that this, the talks share a common theme of examining future applications that demand unprecedented scaling of computation and data and their societal impact. And today's talk may seem a little bit different, but it's looking at a different kind of sc uh, scalability challenge, and that is uh, the unprecedented demand for training undergraduate students. So today's speaker is Sriram Krishnamurthy from Brown University, whose work spans, spans the boundary of programming language design and uh, computer science education. And this work has been recognized uh, with the SIGPLAN Robin Milner, Milner Young Researcher Award, the SIGSOFT Influential Educator Award, and the SIGPLAN Software Award as a member of the RACID team. So with that, I'll introduce Sriram. Thank you, thank you for coming. So I know what you're thinking. When you see a title like computing education, the first thing that runs to your mind is something like, oh my goodness, is he talking about something like SIG CSE? Um, and for those of you who flipped through a SIG CSE proceedings, you're thinking, well, you know, what's this gonna be, like a psych sociology talk? Is he gonna tell us about flipped classrooms? Is he gonna tell us about how to use clickers? Well. Okay, here's what I want to do. First of all, I want to start with a confession, okay? My confession is that once upon a time, that's exactly what I would have thought too. And I also want to tell you a secret. The secret is, that's not an unreasonable thing to think. That's a pretty fair representation of what happens at a conference on computing education. So let me take a minute and tell you why this stuff matters. And, and I know for some of you, you're thinking, well, I'm an outstanding lecturer, my department is outstanding, we're perfect, so what's there for us to learn? And those are all valid, you know, I'm sure that's true even. But um, one of the things that's happening is the community of students learning computing has exploded and diversified, right? And many of you are not in the slightest representative of that community. So just to give you one example, I suspect that many of you when you started to learn how to compute, didn't worry, oh my God, if I do something, will I break the computer? In fact, half of you probably thought, woohoo, let's break it and see what happens, right? Well, but for a student who's worried about that, they're in a much more vulnerable position than you ever were. Secondly, and you know, your opinion might vary on this, but in the US and in fact across the world, computing is now moving to earlier and earlier ages. In this talk, I'm not gonna take a position on it. I'm not gonna to try to defend the starting in primary school or whatever. If you want, we can talk about that later. But the point is this is starting to happen and the developmental, cognitive, and other concerns of a person at that age are very different from those that you are experiencing in your classrooms. And finally, um, computing is being used to teach other disciplines. So tomorrow, Jeanette Wing is gonna tell us about data science at Columbia. And that's just one example, but there are many, many more. So I, for instance, happen to be a co-director of the largest, one of the largest computing outreach programs in the US called Bootstrap. And Bootstrap is relatively unique in that we don't directly teach computer science, we integrate computing into other disciplines. We work with math teachers, we work with physics teachers, we work with science teachers, but we also work with social, social science teachers, history teachers, right? And the set of concerns that you have as a computer science professor in a computer science class with computer science major at a university are very, very, very different from those of a social studies teacher in a middle school trying to teach history students a data-driven approach to thinking about history, okay? But this talk is not meant to be a defense of SIG CSE. I came here with something else in mind. So let me tell you what my thesis statement is for this talk. What I wanna to try to get across to you, first of all, computing education raises a whole bunch of challenges, and these are challenges 
that require sometimes significant amount of technical skill exactly of the sort that those of us in this room have. And I know in your mind there's probably like a picture of a waterfall now that there's, you know, there's technical skill flowing down to solve a problem. And that's a perfectly good image to have in your head. If you can apply your skill and solve a problem, hey, that's an accomplishment. But even more than that, some of these things can even lead to new technical insights. So now your waterfall picture needs to amend, and I mean, I guess now it looks like an Escher waterfall, right? It goes back right where it started, okay? So I wanna draw on some examples from my own work, uh, primarily motivated by having uh, collaborated on several uh, widely used programming environments. Um, and just to give you like a sort of an, an amuse-bouche, right? Just to wet your whistle a little bit, let me give you a small example of what happens in the Dr. Racket programming environment, okay? So a student writes this very modest, simple program, right? And despite the syntax, you can read what it's saying, right? It says, I define A, and then I add A to four. That's what the student writes, but what actually runs looks something like this. Now, I know you can't read the code, but that's part of the point. And if you're thinking, oh, that's because he generated assembly, no, 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 that's not what I did. The code on the right-hand side is at the same level of abstraction, in fact, in some ways at a higher level of abstraction than the code on the left-hand side. Okay? And it's even not even the entire truth because many of those lines in there actually represent entire libraries and modules and all kinds of complicated things. Why is this? Because that beginning student program has a whole bunch of issues that it doesn't even know it needs to wrangle with that we want to wrangle with on its behalf. We need to provide isolation between the running virtual machine and the student's program. We need to provide isolation in the event queues. We need to manage resources. We need to generate extra information to, get, get, to generate errors. We need to change the error messages. All of these things have to happen somewhere so that the student doesn't have to do it themselves. Okay? All right. So here is the plan for my talk. My talk is going to be in four parts. Um, since I'm here as a guest of PLDI, I thought maybe what I could do is I could talk partly about programming language design and partly about programming language implementation, but of course I know many of you here are not programming languages people, so this is not gonna be like a PL-ish PL presentation, it's gonna be very accessible, I hope. And then, just to make sure that I am respecting the people who are not PL people in the room, I'm gonna do a third part that has nothing to do with PL at all, and then finally I will end with a bunch of open issues and problems, all right? Okay, here we go. So let's talk about programming language design. So to motivate this, let's, let me make a bold statement, okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna quantify over a very large set and I'm gonna make this bold claim that I believe is true of all of them. Take your favorite introductory programming textbook. Doesn't matter which one it is, this happens to be one of my favorites, doesn't have to be yours, okay? Every programming language textbook has a graduated introduction to the language. You start off with some small fragment of the language, and then you grow it, and you grow it, and you grow it, right? It maybe it starts with ex statements, and then it builds up to conditionals, and then to loops, and then to functions, or in my books, pretty much the opposite way around. Doesn't really matter. The point is it grows as it goes. And in fact, even when it gets to the end, it's probably only taught you a sliver of the language, right? Even an intro to programming in Java book rarely covers a good chunk of Java. Intro to programming Python doesn't cover a whole chunk of Python. So the point is, there are these abstractions that the book erects. But from the point of view of a consumer, that's not what you get. What you get is a programming environment, and a programming environment with everything in it. And if it's Eclipse, you can't even count how many buttons it's got. And one of the motivations for this work was actually the wonderful AP Computer Science Board. So the AP Computer Science Board, in its infinite wisdom, decided that we should be using C++ to teach everybody computer science. And people said, you know, it's kind of a complicated language. They said, no, no, we got it, a solution to that, don't worry. We have carefully designed a little subset of the language, and it's documented on, I don't know, page 23 or something like that, and that's the only language you have to use. That assumes that a student will never accidentally stumble outside that subset, right? But in fact, what students do is they make mistakes, they get confused, they have typos, they need error messages. They, the error messages might use vocabulary they've never seen before and they can't make any sense out of what happens. And all of these are exactly the experiences we saw when we saw students in classrooms actually trying to use this beautiful little subset of C++. Because there's a mismatch between the book or the curriculum 
and what the programming environment offers. So what we'd like to do instead is to actually have all those different languages concrete and manifest. So how do we go about building this? Well, obvious answer is, well, build N languages. You're PL people, isn't that what you do? Go build them. Um, but, you know, I just told you there's going to be all these common, they're, they're all like sub-languages, right? So there's commonalities. So maybe instead of building N implementations and having to keep them consistent, maybe you build, you know, one and you put some flags in there. I can tell you from personal experience, there are going to be lots and lots of flags, okay? Many, many, many flags. Looks like the United Nations after a while. And, and when you start thinking about what all these flags are trying to do, you realize that what you're actually getting across is you want to build a language out of sub-languages. You want to put together pieces. You want to combine them. You want to compose them. This sounds like a modularity question. But none of our existing modularity mechanisms are designed around language fragments. So maybe we should take this problem more seriously from a modularity point of view. That is, we have all these existing abstraction techniques. Let's think about the language itself as a piece of modularity. Now, if you're not a PL person in the room, I know you're probably thinking like, oh, come on, aren't you overstating this a little bit? You wanted like, what, four languages for your book and you've suddenly started going off on languages as modules? Well, let me tell you something. Industrial practice more or less reflects this idea. If you look at how programmers program today, if you go, for example, and look at the landscape of, say, JavaScript, people don't just program with libraries, they program with frameworks. And what frameworks do is they effectively try to introduce linguistic abstractions. Many of these frameworks represent lots of different linguistic abstractions that are sort of crammed together within the mechanisms that you actually have in the language, okay? Now, some of you, of course, don't program in JavaScript, uh, but you write papers, right? You write papers, sometimes in text, sometimes in LaTeX, and then sometimes you jump out of LaTeX and you use something like ticks. So now you've got a begin and end ticks, and now you're programming in a different language inside of your LaTeX program. And I know some of you are architecture people, so you probably use circuit ticks, right? So you've got all these languages that are floating around inside your one supposedly LaTeX file, and you're mixing and melding all these languages. But the problem, of course, is if you go to build one of these things, it's a nightmare. Right? We're tool builders. Languages are tools, so it's instinctive for us to want to build languages if we could do it painlessly. But it's not painless. It's painful. We have completely ad hoc or no support at all for building these. Um, the implementations tend to be brittle. Anybody who's used these packages or these libraries knows that. And of course, you know, what happens when you try to compose them? Well, everything falls apart, and eventually Sheridan, send, Sheridan Printing sends you a paper back and says, please remove all of your libraries. Right? So... What could we do that's better? Well, I want to call out a principle that I learned from Joe Armstrong. Joe Armstrong is the uh, designer, the lead designer of the Erlang programming language. Unfortunately, Joe died in April, so I wasn't able to run this quote by him and confirm these are my words, not his, but I think they're pretty close to what he meant. And here's what Joe said. Joe basically said, look, when you make an operation cheap, it changes how programmers interact with it. And you know this, okay? If you are told, look, you've got 100 bytes of memory, you are obsessed with how to control those 100 bytes. When you are told, look, memory, memory, you, you can stop worrying about memory. We've got lots of memory and we've got garbage collection. It completely changes the way you think about programming, okay? When you're told, look, you can make a closure by hand by allocating a data structure and figuring out the environment, well, you could, but you don't. When somebody says, I got a lambda in your language, you're like, off to the races. Joe, of course, was trying to make a point about concurrency. He was trying to say, look, when, when threads are really expensive to make, you spend all this time worrying about, oh, well, maybe we should allocate 100 threads and we should have thread pools, et cetera, et cetera. But if threads are really cheap, if, thre you can, if threads are essentially free like they are in Erlang, you can have millions of threads and you come up with completely new and different ways of thinking about programming. So essentially what Joe was saying is that X-oriented programming means X is really cheap to make and use, and that changes the way you think about your program structures, okay? So our question is, what then is language-oriented programming? And that's what the Racket project is about. And in Racket, in language-oriented programming, we want to make languages cheap and easy to use. And 
we tried a few different things, and then Matthew Flatt had a brilliant design idea, and he said, look, instead of all these complicated mechanisms we'd invented, what if we could just change what an import statement does? We all know import, we all use import all the time in our libraries, and usually what does import do? It gives you names that are bound to functions and types and classes and stuff like that, but import is now allowed to import languages as well. It's allowed to import language extensions, it's allowed to import language restrictions, it's allowed to close over libraries, it's allowed to do all of the things you need for building languages, not just for building modules. And this, this is basically the central design idea, and it's led to this wonderful explosion of languages. Let me give you a few quick examples. So Sam Tobin Hochstadt is somewhere around here. Sam basically said, look, Racket is a dynamic language, but we can build a static language for ourselves. So he built Type Racket, and it's a very sophisticated language with a sophisticated type system that's built completely using Racket in Racket. Well, that's maybe not so surprising. Um, my group has spent the past 10 years working on security analyses for uh, network policies and security policies and so on, and we have this tool called Margrave. Margrave is also a language inside Racket, but as you can see, the syntax doesn't look like, there's no parentheses anywhere, right? Like we've banished the parentheses where they belong outside the frame. Um, in fact, the, the syntax is explicitly modeled on SQL because our intended users are sysadmins. Um, and the semantics is also not the semantics of Racket. The semantics is basically first order model finding. Or my favorite example is actually a language called Scribble. And Scribble is essentially a markup language, okay? It's like LaTeX done right. It's a markup language. You write text the way you would write text in a markup language. You can use Racket as your scripting language. And the cool thing as a book author is I get a power that I don't get out of LaTeX because of embedding in Racket. I get separate compilation. Imagine if every chapter of your book could be separately compiled just like every module in your program is separately compiled. That's the power that I get by this language embedding strategy that I don't otherwise get. And there's hundreds of languages and variants of them, and there's like industrial users and all kinds of other things. And if you want to know more, you can go read this paper that we wrote in CACM last year. But, but, I want us to not lose sight of the message of this talk. We didn't set out to create hundreds of languages. We didn't set out to create scribble and separate compilation in place of LaTeX or anything else. We set out by asking a question. Why don't our programming environments look like our books? How do we reduce the mismatch between the curriculum and the tool that the student is using? How do we take some pain out of the educational experience and enrich it instead? And over the course of 25 years, we've come this full circle where basically we've got a whole different way of thinking about programming language research, but it all comes from thinking hard about one simple educational question, okay? So, that's the end of the programming language design part of this talk. Now I wanna talk about language implementation, right? Um, and to do this, I wanna put you, uh, I wanna help you understand the context of what it's like to work in schools these days. Uh, you'll find any number of articles in the press that have titles like this, right? Apple wants to sell iPads to schools, but Google owns the educational market, Chromebooks are used worldwide, blah, blah, blah. Okay, what's going on? Well. Schools have minimal IT staff. Schools don't want to deal with security problems. Schools have students who have data which is vulnerable and uh, has various privacy concerns. And so they want the most secure environment they can find with the least amount of hassle. And what they've realized is, whether it's Chromebooks or otherwise, basically it's the browser. All of our curricula, for instance, have no choice but to run completely inside the web browser because that's the only environment we can reliably assume at schools. Everything else is locked down and schools don't want to open them up. And in fact, there is now a whole huge amount of effort for training programming that all runs on the web. And some of these are meant to be more school level, some of these are meant to be professional, some of these are professional IDEs, et cetera, et cetera. There's this entire ecosystem where the web is like the new x86 platform, right? It's like every language now runs in some form on the web. Okay, so there are all these commercial people, some of these are actually very well funded, uh, tens of millions of dollars of funding. How's that experience working out for their users? Well, here's a typical message, okay? Um, I accidentally created an infinite loop and I'm stuck, please help. 
Right? And if you go look at the answers, the answer along the lines, well, maybe you should clear your cache. There's one answer that's very detailed and very accurate. It says, well, please open up your Chrome DevTools, and DevTools go down to this entry, right-click on this entry, click on this entry. You know, usual beginner-friendly advice, okay? Um, or another person, uh, bailing out of console, avoiding infinite loops. I feel like in this lesson, considering the high chance of a logic error and while loops, maybe we should give me something. And you know, this person's trying like control X and control C, maybe they came from Windows, they made some poor lost Emacs user, I don't know. Um, hey, and they're trying to figure out what to do, and the advice is like, oh, well, you know, have you considered the following, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, nobody has really has a solution. Uh, the, the final solution for this one was, well, just copy your code and relaunch the browser, and you know, it'll all be fine. Okay. Um, it's true, um, maybe not the most uh, useful educational advice. Uh, or this one, you know, please help me break out my infinite loop. Can somebody, I keep crashing my browser, lol. Right? So, so this, of course, is the point at which the audience starts making jokes about the infinite loop of infinite loop jokes, right? So I'll stop here. <clears throat> and, and, and this last one is actually somewhat old, and I put it up on purpose because they solved this problem. What browsers do now is if your thread keeps running for too long, they will pop up a little thing saying, would you like to kill this? Now, that's great, as long as you don't mind having to restart your entire IDE. But there's a problem, as computer scientists know, sometimes you really want to write an infinite loop. For example, in our educational curricula, in Bootstrap Algebra, you design a video game. In Bootstrap, uh, in the physics curriculum, you design simulations. Guess what? Video games and simulations are infinite loops. So, if you try to write those on a browser, you're gonna keep getting pop-ups saying, do you want me to shut this down? Do you want me to shut this down? Which, of course, you don't wanna shut down at all, right? So the point is the locus of control here shouldn't be the browser. The locus of control should be the user. The browser's never gonna get it right whichever way it goes. Why is this happening? Why do we have all this infinite loop pain and all these other hassles? Well, it's because of a central architectural decision that was made in the browser which is that JavaScript is a single-threaded language, which means only one thing can happen at a time. Now, this, I, I know there's gonna be several people in the room who are like hardcore concurrency folks, and you're probably like, oh, come on, you don't understand, blah, blah, blah. I will make one controversial remark in this talk, which is I think this was an outstandingly good design. And I think it democratized programming in a way that I think would have been unimaginable otherwise. Fight me, we can talk about it later. Okay, so. <clears throat> Given that this is the environment, let me try to give you a little bit of insight about what happens, all right? So what I've got here is I've got a little IDE. I've got a program on the left. You don't need to read the program. It's just like an even and odd mutual recursive function. You can imagine whatever you want. And I've got a run button and a stop button. I've got the stack, and I've got an event queue, okay? So I click on the run button, and a run event shows up. And uh, that's gonna cause program execution to begin. And so program execution is going to start pushing on the stack. So I'll get even of 1,000, even of 990, odd of 999, even of 998, and whatnot. And at some button, at some point, I decide I'm going to press the stop button. Okay? Well, that event handler is sitting there in the queue, but remember, it's a single-threaded language. So we need to wait for this program to finish executing before we can run the stop button. So it continues running, and you know, it keeps running, and maybe I press the stop button again, and it keeps running, and even if you press the stop button really hard and yell stop, it's gonna keep running. It's not gonna run your stop button. So we end up in this lovely paradoxical situation where the stop button can't run because it needs the feature that makes the stop button to exist. Okay, so this is not the only problem you run into. There are lots of other problems. Even if you want to do simple file I.O., you end up with this pattern of asynchronous I.O. and whatnot. And, and there's this phrase in JavaScript, of course, called callback hell. Right? Here's a picture from a JavaScript website called callbackhell.com, right? showing you what this code looks like. And of course, you know, parentheses are terrible, but braces are perfectly OK. So you know, here's what callback hell looks like in JavaScript. Remember, only you can prevent callback hell in forest fires. So what's the broader message here? The broader message is, anytime we run into these weird constraints, we have to make hard choices. We can put the burden on the language developer. We can say, well, you know, maybe we can make it part of the curriculum. And that's not always the wrong answer. If you're a computer science person trying to teach computer science, that's, that's very much part of the curriculum, right? When I teach programming languages, understanding the JavaScript event model is a totally legitimate thing to do. But 
If I'm a physics student in eighth grade trying to figure out how to write a simulation, perhaps callbacks are not the most critical idea to be learning of all the many ideas that are out there, right? And very simply, teachers won't teach it. They'll just go away. Or, of course, you can have a poor learning experience, which I think we agree is not a good thing to have. So there's a more broad principle here, which I'm gonna call a pedagogic system design principle, which is that the limitations of the medium should not become part of the message. It's fine in a computer science setting because the medium is the message in computer science. But when we consider the diversity of learners that I've talked about across ages, across disciplines, across uses, across vulnerabilities, we have to think very hard about not passing all the complexity on to the student. Okay? So let me try to sketch a solution here. Uh, the PL people in the room already know where I'm going, but for the rest of you. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna let this program run for a while, and then maybe the stop button shows up. We're still ignoring it. But at regular intervals, our program is gonna execute a kind of instruction that for the old DOS fans in the room, I'm gonna call it TSR. Right? Basically, we want to terminate this program, but we want it to stay resident. So we're going to make a copy of the stack into something called the continuation, and we'll append a resume event to the queue. And once the resume event is in place, we literally wipe out the program's existence. What that does is it means the event queue is free to go again. And because the event queue is free, if there's a stop button, it can now terminate program execution. But if there's a different event, maybe there's a save file event over there, it runs, and eventually the resume event comes back in place, the resume event puts the stack back in place, the stack continues execution, eventually it does another TSR, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So essentially using this idea of what are known as con continuations, we can get all of the things we wanted. We can get graceful termination, we can support long-running computations, and a whole bunch of issues that I haven't even begun to talk about in this talk, including some of the callback health stuff and, so, and various other features like single-stepping and so on. So that's the basic idea. There are four, for PL audiences, there are four interesting sub-idea, four interesting contributions here. The first is how do you implement continuations? Turns out there's the naive way that really doesn't work very well at all. It's deeply unperformant to the point where you wouldn't want to use that language. We use a technique called stack reconstitution, which appeared in this old theory paper. And, and you know, for, for those of you who don't like reading prose, if you'd rather read this kind of version of it, you can go look at the PLDI paper. All the details are in there uh, of what stack reconstitution is. Um, second, Arjun Guha had this really clever idea. He said, look, we don't want to modify 20 different compilers out there. There's all these X scripts, right? There's like, script, you know, there's like Scala script and Clojure script and something else script and whatnot. So instead, let's just write one compiler as a JavaScript to JavaScript compiler. And then he came up with a clever name for it. He called it Stopify, right? And so what is Stopify? Stopify is a JavaScript to JavaScript compiler. It's a semantics preserving transformation, so it doesn't change the meaning of the program, but it inserts the information into the program so that you can then do this kind of stopification, symbol, single stepping, and so on. The third idea is this question of when do you pause? There are basically two obvious ways to do it, or two obvious policies you can follow. One of those policies leads to a very bad user experience. The other one leads to really bad performance. So instead, we have a much more interesting dynamic strategy that we use, and finally, the fourth one is, some of you are probably thinking, wait a minute, you just told me that you're gonna write a semantics preserving JavaScript to JavaScript compiler. Really? Like, dude, do you know how complicated JavaScript is? As a matter of fact, I do, right? And here's how we do it while maintaining performance. So the issue is JavaScript is this ginormous language, okay? It's so big, I can't even, I'm not even sure what the boundaries of it are. But there's a part of it that's really quite nice, especially from the point of view of getting good performance in the process of stopification. Uh, that picture is not to scale, by the way. Um, so anyway, so you've got this, this nice sub-language, right? And it turns out compiler writers are not completely pathological. Um, all these different compiler writers, basically they inject into JavaScript, and they don't use the whole language. They use different sub-languages that are mostly consisting of the good parts. And as the more of the good parts they use, the higher the performance we can get. So some compilers, we have a 30 times speed down. Sometimes we have a 30% speed down, 
It depends on which compiler you're talking about, and you can keep modifying those compilers to make this process go faster and faster, okay? So, I wanna sort of moral here maybe is, uh, you know, to, to riff on Philip Greenspun's quote, basically any sufficiently JavaScript, complicated JavaScript program has like this really crappy version of continuations. Once you use Topify, you can take all the adjectives out of that sentence, right? So, uh, this is the paper. If you wanna try it out, you can go to stopify.org and uh, there's a whole bunch of languages that you can try it out on. Um, there's, again, commercial users that are starting to use Stopify, but again, that's not the point. The point isn't trying to help commercial users. The point, once again, is to start with a technical problem that students have to confront, distill it down to its technical essence, work on the technical essence, and round trip it back into a solution that you can apply back to helping those students, okay? All right, so that concludes the second part of my talk, which is the part about language implementation. Now I'm gonna give you an example that has nothing to do with programming languages, which is to talk about student misconceptions. So I wanna start by telling you about this. Um, uh, there's a very famous paper in computer, in, in education, sorry, in STEM education. It's a paper called the Force Concept Inventory. Um, and this is a particularly nice place to be talking about it because David Heston, who led this effort, is actually just about 15 minutes down the road. Okay? And Force Concept Inventory, I mean, it was, a, it was a conclusion of a sequence of papers, and, and it was this really wonderful, wonderful idea of something called a concept inventory. What is a concept inventory? So concept inventory is essentially a multiple choice quiz instrument, and there's one correct answer. And you're thinking, aha, can I call all my quizzes concept inventories? No, you cannot, because it has a very special property. The special property is that all of the wrong answers aren't just wrong. They have been carefully researched to correspond with specific misconceptions. Specific misconceptions, okay? So, because it's a multiple choice instrument, there's no ambiguity about what the answer is, what the student wrote, what the student selected. You can use it in lots of different ways. You can use it with clickers, you can use it on quizzes, you can use it on exams, whatever you want. But the key thing is, the wrong answers are rich with information about your student's knowledge or non-knowledge, right? If you find that everybody is picking a particular answer, you don't just know that they're wrong. You know which misconception they have in their head. So let me give you a concrete example of this. This is a, one of the famous illustrations from this paper. So the idea here is there's a person who's twirling a, a, a ball and, and it's all written carefully, steel, raw steel, et cetera, et cetera, to avoid like weird assumptions about things. Anyway, they're twirling a ball and at the point P, Papa, they release or the, the cord snaps right at the ball and the ball flies off. And the question is, what is the trajectory gonna be of the ball? I'm not gonna ask you, you all know the right answer. Turns out most physics students, even college graduates in physics, don't, okay? All right, <clears throat> so what does this have to do with computer science? Well, this idea of a concept inventory is a great idea. We'd love to have concept inventories, right? Who here wouldn't love to have a concept inventory? That's what I thought, okay. So, um, and in fact, no, no, put your hand down. Okay, so, in fact, <laughs> Having former students in the audience is the worst thing, man. Right. So, um, last, uh, just this past, uh, like two months ago, uh, SIG CSE was celebrating its 50th year and decided that they're gonna like select, I don't know, the best 10 papers of the past 50 years or something. And it turns out paper number one, I don't know if the ordering matters or not, but the point is one of the top 10 papers is this paper on identifying student misconceptions because the heart of the concept inventory process is identifying misconceptions. You gotta find out what misconceptions the students have, then you use that to generate the questions, and then you make sure that the questions actually lead to those misconceptions, okay? So this is the hard, interesting, important part of it. <clears throat> okay, so let me give you a sample, a sample question from this uh, misconception uh, inventory. So here is a Java programming question. The, the, the context of this is Java. Uh, you know, what should the values of X and Y be to fill all the elements of the following array with minus one? I'll give you like, you know, 10 seconds to stare at the program. Okay, and the quiz actually contains four answers, okay? And you all know what the right answer is, of course. But you notice that 
basically the wrong answers, they're called distractors. The distractors are getting at common mistakes that students have, right? In this case, misconceptions about how array indexing works, right? So essentially, there are two places you can get confused here about where to start and how to end, and so these four cases cover the four different ways in which you can get confused, right? Okay, so far so good. That's what a concept inventory is. Now, let me show you how a concept inventory is traditionally generated. Okay, it's, it's basically, it's a program, right? There's a script we follow for generating concept inventory. Um, there's a lot of detail on the slide and I don't expect you to read it. What I want you to notice is the stuff that I have highlighted, okay? All of the work is being done by experts. Experts do this, experts do that, experts do something else, experts follow this complicated thing called a Delphi process, they're gonna do interviews, oh, and the students will say a little bit in the middle, but then experts will do more work, right? It's a very expertise-driven process. You don't have to be a PL person to recognize that this is not a very efficient program, right? So the difficulty with this kind of process is it's really expensive. You actually need like NSF grants to write to generate one of these things. It's a ton of time and labor, and when you're done, you're wiped out. You can't revise it. And what's even worse is, there's very few of these because of this, but what's even worse is, it may not even apply to your course. Like that award paper is about a title that ostensibly applies directly to my course, and I can't use any of the questions. So what am I supposed to do? I would like concept inventories for my class too. So, well, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna engage in a little bit of computational thinking, right? We're gonna think like computer scientists. We have this extremely precise program that is extremely expensive to run. Well, what do we do in, you know, approximate computing, in AI, in all of these fields? We say, well, you know, maybe we can just change the problem a little bit. Maybe we can get a good enough answer for very cheap. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna rewrite the program, right? What I'm gonna do is a new program where we're gonna, experts are still gonna generate the prompt, but then the tight loop is gonna have only students in the loop. The students are gonna contribute the questions, something is gonna identify good questions, hold on to that for a moment, and then the students are gonna respond with the answers and the rationale, right? And once we have all of this, the experts are gonna select the questions and you know, figure out, put together the final instrument. So essentially I've done hoisting, right? I've hoisted the experts out of this loop, okay. Um, now, you're probably thinking, like, wait a minute, this, this, like, your stu students are awfully convenient, but uh, is this even a good idea? Uh, actually, there is a very good pedagogic justification for this. There's an there's a idea in education that's called contributing student pedagogy, and it's something I think all of us can relate to. Anybody in this room who has ever said, you know, I only really understood it when I tried to teach it? Yeah? Okay, that's what it is. Well, we get to benefit from that, why don't our students? So contributing student pedagogy is we basically allow our students to contribute to the process of pedagogy. And what we do is we try to harness that idea to help them generate this, this, this collection of misconceptions, okay? And there's a whole lot more I could say about this, but I'm gonna, you know, I wanna keep this part of the talk not too long. Um, what do we need to do? The critical step is this somehow, right? I just sort of waved my hand and said somehow we're gonna do this. Well, so what's involved here? We need to choose one of many questions. That question has to produce, hopefully, an interesting response, but the response it does produce tells us something about how interesting it was so that we can go back in the iteration, we know what to do with that question next. This sounds familiar, right? This is just reinforcement learning. So that's what we do. We still use experts at the beginning, but then we stick a reinforcement learning algorithm in the middle because that way it's completely automated. We don't have to have humans involved in making that decision. And then at the end, we can also use the weights that we get out of the reinforcement learning to help us sort and you know, rank these questions and figure out which ones might be more or less interesting, okay? So one of the studies we've done of this is we tried to, we tried to reproduce part of that, part of that paper. Um, we found some misconceptions in common. Um, each of us found things that the other did not, which is interesting that even though they spent all of this time, we were able to come up with things they didn't, and then they had things we didn't. Again, a lot of details here that I'm glossing over. Um, it took about 30 hours of expert time, and it cost about $50 of uh, Amazon Web Services. So the main downside to this whole thing is uh, you can't get an NSF grant for this anymore because, like, you know, it's kind of 50 bucks is not a lot to ask for in a grant. It's, you might get rejected if you ask for that little. 
Um, so this is a process that we've implemented as a tool. It's on the web, it's called Quizius. And if you, I would love to have people try it out. If you want to try it out, you can go to the site and you can set up an instance and we'd love to talk to you about setting up something like this, okay? All right, so those are the three parts of my talk. I want to end by talking about some open issues. And I have to confess here, um, I sat down and started writing open issues, and the next thing I knew I had about 30 slides, so I threw out most of them. Don't worry, I know you have to go to lunch. So I'm going to give you just about three or four things to think about. Um, first, for the PL people in the audience, if you're curious about open issues in PL and education, uh, just this year, a new Cambridge Handbook in Computing Education Research came out, and Kathy Fisler and I wrote a chapter on, uh, well, they wanted us to write about programming paradigms. I don't believe in paradigms, so we put the word paradigms in the title and then said, and beyond, and then skipped over the paradigms part. Um, so anyway, so this chapter lists a whole bunch. I think there's about, at least about a dozen open questions that we describe over here. So PL people, if you're interested, just go look over there. That's all I'm going to say here, okay? Um, but there's people with lots of different kinds of expertise in this room. And, you know, there's this old joke about how psychology is the study of the American collegiate student, right? Because, yeah. Well, in some ways, sometimes it feels like computing education research is the study of CS1 and traditional imperative languages, right? Or objects if you want to get really ambitious. And for similar reasons, but there's a whole wide world of computer science out there that's still waiting for us to understand more about our learning methods and about student learning and about concept inventories and all these other things. And in fact, when we've started to do research in these other courses, we're kind of dismayed about some of the things we're finding. So I feel less confident about myself as a teacher. Your confidence you should keep, that's good. But um, you might want to consider that a lot more of computer science needs to be investigated than is currently being investigated in the literature. Next, um, Bruce Schneier wrote this lovely uh, blog post many years ago about what he called the security mindset. It's not a thing we've really studied and understood as a community, but I think there are other mindsets also that are worth studying. Is there sort of a data mindset for people who know how to really think about data and understand the structure of data? And something that is of great personal interest to me as a formal methods person is a specification mindset. And the more we produce synthesis tools and verification tools and property-driven testing and all of these other things, where we may be reducing the need for programmers, but we're ramping up the need for people who are qualified in thinking about specification. And actually, I think all three of these things are related. I think all three of these have some commonality in terms of our ability to really explore state spaces. And that's something we're kind of not very good at as humans. So how do we make the next generation of computer scientists better at that? What are the practices we need to engage in? It is a fascinating question to me. Um, <clears throat> speaking of uh, formal methods, uh, we produce all of these tools, and we know very little about the human factors outcomes of those. We know quite a bit now about programming environments. We know virtually nothing about these tools. Uh, my group did one of the first studies of one of these questions, and, uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, so uh, it's not good. So I think we need to be thinking much more about not just producing tools, but also thinking about the human interaction parts of it. And the last thing I wanna bring up is uh, accessibility. Uh, one thing that's been a focus for our Bootstrap project for the past three years is um, how do we work with visually impaired programmers? And let me, let me suggest you do this experiment. You can do it as a thought experiment, but it's even more effective if you do it as an actual experiment. Next time you're sitting in front of your laptop and you're trying to program, close your eyes. Just close your eyes and try to program. Give your, turn on a timer for say about 10 minutes and try to program and see what that experience is like. Um, now, I, I don't want to give this the wrong message, like, oh my God, it's impossible, therefore we should forget about it. I would rather take a more positive message. There are blind programmers, and they're kind of remarkable. We work with someone named Sina Bahram. There's lots of others out there. Um, but we're not servicing this community very well. And if we could service them better, we'd get a much broader range of really qualified people to work with. So I think we should think about that. But that's only one form of accessibility. There are lots of other kinds of accessibility, too. One other we're, thing we're thinking about in Bootstrap is, what about people with learning impairments? How do our curricula work for people with learning impairments? And there are lots of other questions like that. So I would encourage you to think more broadly about all of these different audiences. While I have this bully pulpit here, I want to also make two pleas, okay? The first, um, 
this, this really goes back to a kind of, uh, a sort of hubris that we have as computer scientists, um, which is, you know, there's this phrase, computational thinking. I even threw it out earlier in the talk to see if anybody would flinch. Um, there's a beautiful essay by Jeanette Wing about it where she sort of identifies two kinds, but one of them is the really interesting kind. And it basically has to, essentially, if you learn computer science, you get to be really good at all these other things. You don't, okay? There's essentially one really, really robust in, result in education. It's on this concept of transfer. Transfer is if you know how to do something here, you can also figure out how to do something there, and this is really a robust set of results that says, no, you don't. Not unless you're very carefully, explicitly designed for it, and even there, probably not so much. So we shouldn't fall into this trap of thinking just because we've taught computer science, we've taught problem solving, and everybody's gonna be magically better. In fact, I'm now starting to find in some studies I'm doing that we don't even get transfer within a computer science curriculum from adjacent courses, okay? So forget about learning computer science, therefore being really great at something else. We can do it, but it requires very careful design. And the last thing I wanna say is I would like to speak out in defense of qualitative methods. We are all, all of us here, maybe most of us here are kind of mathy people. We like math, we like numbers, we like quantities, we like putting numbers on things, and that's all good. But at the end of the day, our goal here is not numbers, it's insight, and insight often comes from qualitative methods. When you do an interview, you interview three people, you'll learn more than you might from like a thousand times that of like data mining, right? And we run into this danger when you try to write a paper, for example, you're like, it's small n, like what's your n is 12, n is three, oh my God. But it really depends on the question you're trying to ask. And I would ask you to be a little more pluralistic in the epistemologies you're willing to consider, because there are lots of good ways to gain knowledge, and let's not try to assume that the only way to do so is through numbers, okay? That's the end of my ranting at you. Um, just to summarize, I gave you four parts to this talk. The first part was about language design, where we started with this question about books and ended up at languages as units of composition. The second part was about language implementation, where we started with the browser's uh, limitations and ended up solving that and coming up with like new kinds of uh, programming tools. The third one is about student learning. We started with this idea of concept inventories and then morphed it into something that we could do cheaply, quickly, cheaply, and dirtily and talked about this tool called Quizius. And finally, I gave you a bunch of open questions to think about. Um, that's my email address. Uh, if you disagree with me and want to yell at me on social media, you can do it on Twitter, whatever. Thank you for coming to the talk. And I would... I would love to take your questions, criticisms, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Go for it, the mics are over here. Please do come up to the mic so that everybody can hear your question. Questions or if I have completely have. persuaded you of everything, then my job is done. So. Hey, Shriram, I'll get the ball rolling. Uh, thanks for a great Thank talk. You, so um, for the third part of your talk, as you know, many people have been trying to mine data from code, from social media, and so on. Do you see opportunities over there? Absolutely. In fact, uh, in my talk abstract, I very explicitly said that this talk was not going to talk about educational data mining, yeah. just because that is a very vibrant area, and it's almost, in some sense, it's our instinctive reaction as computer scientists, especially these days, in these days of like prevalent AI, to say, oh, maybe it's a data mining opportunity. Absolutely is. There's tons of opportunities, but again, it depends a little bit on the kind of question you want to ask. Some of the questions we want to ask, I'm not going to, I don't know how to get out of keystroke data. So when we did error message analysis, absolutely having a record of every single keystroke is the most valuable thing you can have. But if what you want to do is to ask some very high level design questions, it seems quite hard to get some of those out of these. You get a lot more of it out of doing qualitative methods. And my colleague Kathy Fizzler has been leading the charge on some of these questions and doing really nice work on it. Um, she actually gave a keynote at Oopsla that was called In Defense of Little Code. Right? Because the big code part we all know, but the little code part is also important. So that's all not to say that your question is not, your question is like basically 200% valid. I want to make a case for that, but also a case for the opposite. But I think as our AI methods get better and better, it's possible that we'll see more convergence. We'll find that we can actually lift higher level insights out of this data mining. Absolutely true. Okay. No question. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I really liked the first part of uh, your talk on 
sort of growing the, the things that you can do in a language. Um, and I had a chat with Tom Ball earlier this week about uh, the same kind of problem that shows up in math, where uh, the way we introduce students to the equality symbol oh. gives them the exactly the wrong idea about what equality means. And yeah. I was wondering if you had some thoughts on, oh. on doing the same kind of thing in other domains. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in a certain sense, part of what we're doing is by um, bringing programming media into educating in other subjects, we can control the introduction of some of these things. Equality is a great example. In fact, uh, my colleague, Emmanuel Chancellor and Bootstrap, his advisor, John Starr, Harvard Grad School of Education, basically is one of the world's experts on equality symbols. And you'd be shocked by how many papers you can write on, equal on the equality symbol, right? It's because it's like one of the most overloaded symbols we use. So there's a lot there. And it's hard to figure out how to control the medium in something like math. But when you push it into a programming context, it's much easier. The danger there is if you walk into a school and say, hey, I got some awesome programming languages. Wouldn't you like to teach math in a new way? The answer is usually nope. <laughs> okay? And, and for good reason. Because just because you have an awesome programming tool doesn't mean that that person is actually going to learn math. So the way you persuade a person that you have something to contribute is you have to do the research to demonstrate that those transfer effects exist. The act of learning programming is actually going to make you better at doing math, or at least as good at doing math, and you get some auxiliary benefits. If you can do that work and convince them, then they will try a tool, and now you're in the door, and now you can accomplish these kinds of things. But absolutely, I'm, you're thinking the way I'm thinking, and I'm thinking the way you're thinking. Yeah. Yes? Can, can we Hi. have the, uh, can we have uh, you identify yourself in your institution? Oh, oh sure. Right. Hi. I'm Gautam. I'm from the University of Pennsylvania. I have a question sort of related to um, teaching students languages and sort of how maybe we get a bit of a schism in the community from maybe imperative versus functional versus different styles of programming languages and how that relates to someone who learned their first, you know, uh, their first program class was in Scheme versus an imperative language. Wow, do you actually want to get to lunch or? <laughs> So, so, so you have any thoughts? Yeah, let me, I'm not going to answer that question, okay? Because uh, let me just say this. This is a question. The question is perfectly valid, okay? The question is super valid. The problem is, um, this, is a, this is an area in which we have only heat and no light, okay? Nobody has actually bothered and sat down and asked a rigorous testable, hypo made a testable hypothesis and then bothered trying to test that hypothesis. Um, there's a lot of literature in cognitive science about cognitive load and about naming. You know, you mentioned bare equality. There's also issues about naming. And even, you know, I think about functional programming. What is functional programming? Is it points free? Like if you're Nikhil, you're gonna program in a completely different way than if you're like somebody who likes to put names all over your code, right? There are all these questions. I think it's really ripe. It's really ripe. I have some conjectures because there's also a question about the cost of building your program versus the cost of maintaining your program, right? These are hard experiments to set up. I'd love to talk to people who want to seriously think about this question and perhaps even set up like multi-university studies and things like that, but it requires somebody who's decided that they really want to focus on this question. It's not a question we're going to get by like, you know, casual studies here and there. So that's my short answer. Thank you for the question. Hi. Hello, I'm SG from Facebook. Uh, I'm wondering how much of these things you have explained can be lifted to like actual programmers because in an educational environment, it's more controllable, right? You have access, you are the teacher, but what do you think about like this ideas, how it can be? That's a great lifted? question, thank you. Um, I, so I wanna make a decision, so here's, the, here's one of the things is, the question is how are you trying to educate someone, right? There's, again, this tendency in computer science to think, well, if you just give them an IDE and maybe you give them a little tutorial in JavaScript, they'll all become JavaScript programmers. Well, they will, they'll become some kind of JavaScript programmer, right? But is that the one you want? Um, I think we fail to consider the difficulty that programmers have in even getting off the ground. It's a, the phrase I like to use is the blank page syndrome, right? When you give a programmer a problem to solve, it's actually an incredibly difficult thing to do. Right? They've got a blank screen, and they've got this problem statement, and somehow they had to magically fill up this blank screen with a bunch of you know, weird incantations that are going to solve exactly that problem. That's a hard task. We need to scaffold that task. We need to break it down into subtasks. And my group has built a whole bunch of tools trying to think about what those subtasks would be. Tools for helping with data structure design, tools for helping. Do you know, it turns out, there's several studies that show that programmers often get the problem wrong because they solved the wrong problem in the first place. 
You give them a problem, and for various reasons, like cognitive recall, they recall a different problem, and that's the one they solve instead. When you think about your curricula, what are you doing to make sure your students have understood the problem before they move on to the program? Right? There's a regular expression that meets both those things, but those aren't the same word. Right? So where do we have those tools? These are all things where there's very good cognitive evidence we need to provide. So to me, it's a little less about is the medium controlled, or is the medium the wide open internet? The question is more, what is your cognitive approach to thinking about problem solving? Did you break it down into steps? And I don't mean like top down or bottom up, like well, I don't know what the heck top down even design even means. Right? I don't know what top is and what bottom is. But, but do we have actionable, quantifiable steps that we've decomposed the problem into? Have we built tools to help students do it? And because many of these things can be turned into automatable tools, once we can automate it, of course, we can put it out on the internet. We don't need a teacher in the room. But then, of course, we run into this problem that MOOCs have always had, which is, oh, everybody obviously is as motivated to learn as we are. And it turns out, no, everybody is not. In fact, most people are happy watching the Cricket World Cup instead. Look, I wouldn't mind doing right now, but anyway. Um, so, uh, you know, so we, we have to take into account human account, you know, what do human, what do humans care about? What are humans motivated by? And all of those factors also to create really good educational environments. Those are the important things to me, and it's a little less important whether it's in a classroom or not. It just becomes harder, a little harder if you don't have a teacher in the room. Is that, does that ma make sense and answer your question? Thank you. Hi, sorry, I meant to keep you waiting for a long time. No problem. Uh, hi, I'm Ari Rosenthal. Uh, I'm starting at University of Chicago in the fall. Anyway, um, so I just came out of, you know, an undergrad computer science education. And um, I sort of hesitate to say this because I think perhaps like some of the faculty of that computer science education are here in the audience. It's okay, they promise not to hear what you okay, said. Okay, okay. <laughs> I think some of them left anyway. But anyway. Um, but, you know, coming out of that experience, I think the reality is that a lot of uh, computer science students are apathetic in class. And my question is, how do you teach for an apathetic student? Because, you know, only, uh, only some of your computer science classes will be directly applicable to you uh, afterwards. And That's that's a very good, well, okay, I was hoping nobody would ask me hard questions today, but unfortunately you have. Thank you for that question. That's a great question. Um, look, I think there's a few different things to say about that. One is, uh, one is a question about curriculum design, okay? And, and I'm not here to talk about Brown, but I'm just gonna make one comment about Brown that I think is kind of amusing to me, which is not that, not you chumps, okay. So here's the amusing thing. It turns out there is literally no course in the computer science department that is required for everyone. Every course you take, there is at least one other course you can take. There's a choice on every single point. Even our intro classes, we have like some insane, we have like four different intro sequences leading to the major. Right? It was completely crazy. I think we should have like two at most, but anyway. The point is there's always choice. One of the things, now choice is expensive, it's hard to implement, it's expensive in terms of resources, but what it does is it reduces a lot of this like friction that you otherwise have where students are like, well, I'd rather, not, I, I don't really want to be in this class. Well, when you give people a sense of choice, they get a sense of control, they get a sense of like, I'm go governing my destiny a little more, okay? That's one kind of variable. But the other thing is also finding the thing that people care about. It turns out people do care about things. Almost everyone cares about something. So in Bootstrap, in algebra, um, we ask students to design a video game. And here's what happens. You ask them to design a video game and they're like, oh, um, I know what I want. I want like, I don't know, Doom or World of Warcraft or something like that. You're like, oh, okay. Well, you know, let's talk about this for a moment, okay? Um, these games cost, I know, about 100 million. They're like roughly, you know, Hollywood blockbuster costs. Uh, what do you have? I got a few quarters. You know, okay, fine. So we're not, gonna be, we're not gonna be able to build that. We you see, tamp down the expectations. But then you say, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about designing a small number of elements. What's a player? What's a danger? What's a target? What's your background? And those four little elements to most computer science teachers, this is horrible. You've taken away our creativity. You've taken away our independence. Like, you know, the First and Second Amendment of computer science has been violated, right? Turns out it's complete nonsense. We've done studies on this topic. It totally doesn't matter. Those four elements give students a sense of ownership. They feel like they own it. Let me tell you, who are, whatever you may have had in your undergrad class, I can't imagine it matches the apathy of middle schoolers in an algebra class in the United States, okay? And we can get to those students. 
They take ownership. Students tell stories out of these games. They say, well, I learned about environmental problems, so I built a game to help Karnas, you know, catch dirt in the environment. I built this game out of Batman because my younger brother is a big fan of Batman and I wanted to build a game for him. I built it for this, I built it for that. They tell these great stories. You can help people personalize their education, tell a little story, and when they do, they, they start to suddenly care quite a bit more. How to do that at scale and how do we do that with you know, 200,000 computer science students in our departments? I don't know the answers to that, but I'm saying that we have some of the elements. Did you have a question? This will be the last question. Uh, yeah, I wanted to know if you had any work on um, people uh, teaching classes where there's a lot of heterogeneity, especially in the socioeconomic backgrounds of students, um, because, uh, I mean, Brown is not quite like UMass <laughs> um, in terms Bootstrap of Bootstrap operates only with heterogeneity. But, so at the uh, bootstrap level, absolutely. You mean at the college level? Uh, yeah, in particular because, um, I mean, I would imagine at the middle class level, since middle schools are at the, uh, you know, neighborhood level, that there's going to be a little more heterogeneity than, say, like, your state flagship university. I mean, I, I haven't, Brown has not yet fired me, so I can't tell you much about teaching uh, uh, outside Brown. But I can tell you from our bootstrap experiences that we work extensively in middle schools and high schools that are profoundly diverse, way more diverse, in fact, than most universities, because universities have a huge advantage. They get filtering, right? Schools don't get filtering. Public schools get no filtering at all. In fact, one of the reasons we started working on programming for visually impaired people is if you want to be in a CS for all curriculum, you got to be for all. You can't be, oh, those three students in your class who have visual impairments, I'm sorry, they can't participate in this curriculum. Nobody will use that curriculum. Okay, so I think we have a ton of experience from Bootstrap of working with incredibly diverse student populations. And I think anything that I've said that relates to Bootstrap absolutely applies to very diverse populations. College level, I know less because, you know, unfortunately I live in this gilded cage, so yeah, what can I say? Good, thank you very much, I've gone over time. You have announcements to make. Thank you, speaker.